By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are showing you magic from the Urborg Lions Plains Pillage old school tournament in Dusseldorf, Germany. And we have actually reached the top eight. We have reached the quarter finals. And in the quarter finals, we see Alexander on the left playing with a red Kobolds deck. And he is taking on Michael from Germany, who's playing with an aggro control combination of white, green, and blue spells. And it's proved to be quite a strong deck. So this is going to be an exciting matchup. Now, before we go to the actual games, I'm first going to go through both of these decks. I have pictures of both of these decks. So I'm going to do a little deck deck. Now, if you want to skip that, no problem. Check the description below and there you will find a timestamp. One of them says MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to game number one. And here we are going to continue with the deck deck, starting with the Kobolds deck. And here we see Alexander's Kobold deck. Now, the thing with these decks is that um, the danger, I should say, with these decks for when you're playing with it is that you can run out of ammo. And what I mean by that is it's quite cheap to play all these spells. Kobolds of Kirk keep is zero. All the other Kobolds are two mana to cast. So you're running out. The Lightning Bolt is cheap to cast. The Bloodlust is cheap to cast. So early in the game, you'll probably deal some damage, but then you're running out of cards. What are you going to do? Well, Alexander obviously chose for the Jam Day Tome strategy. He's probably thinking, I don't need a lot of mana to cast everything that I want to cast. So when I have mana left over, I want to use it to draw cards. And the Jam Day Tome offers him that strategy. So he, he's going to put those tomes on the board. He's going to draw extra ammunition and then he can play that out. What I really like about this deck as well are the four Suchis. You know, Suchis, they, they work against the Abyss and they also kind of force the opponent to choose with the artifact removal between a Suchi and a Jam Day Tome. So that's could be difficult for them in specific situations. I also really like the two Ashnot's Altars that are here on top of the Jam Day Tome. Ashnot's Altar is an artifact from the Antiquities and you can sacrifice a creature to the altar and then you get two colorless mana in return. So you get two for a creature. That may not sound very good, but if you want to cast a lethal fireball and you've got a lot of O1 kobolds on the board and you've got Suchis on the board, remember when a Suchi goes to the graveyard, you get four mana in return. So sacrifice a Suchi to the altar and you get two from the altar, four from the Suchi, that's six. If you also have a few kobolds, before you know it, you'll have 10 mana without actually having to tap anything. I mean, how crazy is that? And then you still have all your mana open. So it's very easy with this deck to cast a huge fireball and finish your opponent. Furthermore, you know, there are lightning bolts in here. There are bloodlusts in here. There are super cheap creatures in here. So you probably deal, let's say, seven or eight damage before the game is actually started. And then your opponent is on 12 and you can simply finish him with, you know, the rest of the direct damage. Another great card in this deck is Blood Moon. Don't underestimate Blood Moon. It's a killer against tier one decks. And I think against Michael's deck in this matchup, I mean, it's going to be difficult. The, th the thing that kind of speaks for Michael, and I'm now already kind of thinking about Michael's deck, he's playing with white, so he's got disenchant. So of course, disenchants are great against those uh, um, those blood moons. And I wonder if Michael's also playing with counter spells. I'm sure, I'm sure he is. And of course, he's playing with blue, so he's got blue elemental blast after sideboarding against the fireball. So, I mean, it's not going to be easy for Alexander, but I think with an aggressive deck like this, if it's your day, and I guess it is his day because he's reached top eight, who knows? If you, if you make it to the quarterfinals, why wouldn't you make it to the semifinals? So this is going to be a really interesting matchup. Let's go and take a look at Michael's deck. And here we see Michael's deck. Now, basically, this is an Urnum Ganon deck, right? I see the Urnum Jins and I see two Armageddons. And I also see, you know, kind of what defines, defines, yeah, de sorry, defines an Urnum Ganon deck. We see the cheap ramp, we see Lunawar Elves, we see Birds of Paradise. So basically what you want to do here is you start your game, you want to play a Mana Dork, or you want to play a Mox, or you want to play a Soul Ring, or a Black Lotus, or you know what, maybe a, a Black Lotus, a Soul Ring, a Mana Dork. Anyway, you want to build your mana base very early in the game. Then you want to drop a big creature, and then you want to cast an Armageddon to kind of take control of the game because then you have a big creature or multiple creatures your opponent probably has nothing or a small creature on the board and you can kind of win by that but this deck is more than just Urnumgeddon as you can see there are only two Armageddons in this deck he's also playing with an Ifbifafrit which I find interesting he's playing 
aggressively, as you can see, with those four Savannah lines. He's also playing with two side blasts, which I think could be quite useful. You know, they can be great finishers and also great control cards. And talking about control, the white in this deck is really what gives you control. As you can see, four Disney Chance, three Swords to Plowsiers. Interestingly enough, he's not playing with counter spells or power sinks. So he's chosen not to do that. He's also not playing with land tech. So he's not really going fully on the Armageddon train. He's really chosen for, you know, I'm going to have Armageddon and I'm going to cast it at the right time, but it's not going to be my main strategy. So I find it interesting. We also find uh, the blue power in here. Uh, we find all those um, restricted cards that you kind of see there. You see Chaos Orb, you see Ancestral Recall, Regrowth, Balance, Demonic Tutor, Time Walk. Uh, he's also playing with one Sylvan Library. That's not a restricted card, of course. Interesting to only play with one, by the way. I usually prefer playing with two when I play it with the Demonic Tutor, but that's my personal preference. What I really like in this deck, by the way, is the Stormseeker. I think it's an amazingly cool card. For the people that don't know, it's one green and three. It's an instant, and it reads, a target opponent gains damage equal to the amount of cards that he or she has in hand. So if you cast this just after the draw step, it has a potential to deal eight damage. What I also like about the Stormseeker, it punishes players for playing with Ancestral Recall. They're going to Ancestral for three. Sure, you Ancestral for three. You know what? Use your Library of Alexandria before. Go to eight, Ancestral for three. Have 11 cards. Congratulations. Oh, guess what? Stormseeker. <laughs> Stormseeker. Exactly. I kind of like that. And what I also like about this deck, so Michael, I want to congratulate you on that. You're not playing with Mind Twist. Um, I, I think that's, that's pretty cool because it must be tempting to play with Mind Twist since you already splash a little bit of black there for the Demonic Tutor. I guess you're using your City of Brasses for Demonic Tutor and you've got your bir birds and you've got your one single Bayou and of course your Black Lotus. So, you know, you could have splashed in a Mind Twist, but you decided not to. Instead, you go for a Storm Seeker. I salute you, sir. You know, I appreciate that. Um, when we look at the sideboard, let's take a look. Of course, we see the blue elemental blasts. I think they're going to be really, really useful um, against uh, the deck that he's going to play against, against the Kobolds deck. I also think that the energy fluxes are going to be very useful. And perhaps he's even going to board in that extra side blast. So who knows? So this is the deck of Michael. In my opinion, he is the slide favorite. On the other hand, like I said, in Alexander's uh, deck deck, if a red deck has a good opener and you know everything is working for him he can definitely win against this deck and i mean he has made it all the way to the quarterfinals so who knows but i think i think that michael is is a favorite here maybe 60 40 70 30 but you know what we'll see let's go to game one game number one and we've got the kobolds player on the left alexander and on the right we've got the white green blue agro control player I guess he also plays with a little bit of black splashy in that demonic tutor. It looks like it's Michael here on the play, starting with the Savannah line. So early pressure here from Michael. Let's see what Alexander can do. Playing his Loa Library of Alexandria and using it straight away. So maybe he's going to cast a Kobolds of Kirk Keep. Let's see if he has one. Actually, he doesn't. He's discarding here. Astronaut's Altar hitting the bin. I was really expecting a Kobolds of Kirk Keep here. He's going to go to 18. There is a City of Brass playing another Savannah Lions passing turn here. And you see Alexander using that Loa straight away. So going to 9 in hand, playing Hammerheim 8 in hand. Tapping the Hammerheim and there is a Lightning Bolt on one of the two lines. Kind of taking off that pressure here for Alexander. I think that's a good decision. Another attack that's going to bring him to 16. And let's see what else can he do. Passing turn here, so there's actually not any extra pressure coming on the board from Michael. That is quite interesting here. And again, Alexander's drawing two cards because of that Library of Alexandria playing a Mishra's Factory. And there is a Kobold's Taskmaster and a Kobold's of Kirk Keep. That does mean that he's going to, I believe, six in hand now. Of course, that's enough. After his draw step, he'll have seven again and he can use his Library. Savannah Lines now in play. The question is, is he going to attack with the Lines offering a trade? And then the second question is, will Alexander take the trade? Okay, so he is going to attack here with his 2-1. Block, and oh, it starts to plow here. So what's happening here is the Kobold uh, Taskmaster is giving plus 1, plus 0 oh to all the Kobolds. But what Michael does, 
before damage is dealt, but after blockers are declared, he's sorting the Taskmaster. That means the Cobalt of Kirkkeep turns into an 0-1 again, and it, it dies against the Savannah Lions. And here's a Blood Moon, and there is a quick disenchant by Michael. Blood Moon is a very good card against Michael's deck, but there is that disenchant by um, by Michael straight away. So bad luck here for Alexander. And, and I mean, he's taking some punches. He's still on 17. He's got time enough. He still has a Library of Alexandria, but this is pretty tough for him. Losing the Blood Moon and losing the two Kobolds after that brilliant Swords to Plowsier move. And there seems to be some discussion about the Disenchant. I think it was all legal because in response to the casting of the Blood Moon, he can actually tap his City of Brass and Tundra to still get the white mana that he needs and use that to disenchant the Blood Moon. So to my knowledge, it's all legal. And there we see Michael drawing a card, playing a Mox Emerald, attacking with the Lions. And of course, now he can play Urnum. Will we see an Urnum Jin? There is the Urnum 4-5 Powerhouse from the Arabian Knights. And things are looking bad for Alexander. He needs to do something against this. And playing another Blood Moon, quite nice, because he is tapped out now. But I wonder if Michael really cares, since he now has six on the board. And also playing a Strip Mine here that, of course, has turned into a Mountain because of that Blood Moon. So he can now swing in for six. That means that Alexander is going to drop to nine. And of course, I mean, this Blood Moon resolving and the sticking on the board, it's good news for Alexander, but... The immediate threats here or the two Urnum Jins. And I wonder if Michael can do anything now. He still has one green mana because of that Mox. Just passing turn here. And oh, there was the Stormseeker. Sweet. So I talked about Stormseeker a little bit in the deck deck. It's a card from Legends. One green and three. And it deals damage to your opponent equal to his hand size. So he's taking five damage going down to four. Playing a Suchi. Probably be forced to block the Urnum. Actually, he is, because the Urnum's going to swing for four. Tapping. Play, oh, playing an Icy Manipulator. And this is game. So game one here goes to Michael. So he's ahead in these uh, quarterfinals here, winning the first game. And let's uh, give these players some time to sideboard. And we'll catch back up to them in game number two. Game number two. So we're going to see Alexander on the play here. And uh, that was quite a nice, uh, nice game uh, one finish for for Michael. And you can see how aggressive his deck could be. And I, that sorts to plows here play was just a killer. Oh, interesting. Now we see Michael with the Library of Alexandria. And this is a nice answer to that. A city in a bottle probably coming in from the sideboard here, taking care of that Library of Alexandria. And that city could play a pretty big role here, also considering the... Uh, the Urnum Jins that he's playing. Okay, so ooh, there's a Disenchant. So using his Black Lotus for three white, casting his Event Alliance and a Disenchant. And here we see a Lunar Elves. Wow, I mean, this, this game is really starting off spectacular. There is a Mace of If and a Cobalt Taskmaster. I wonder if he's going to attack now with this Cobalt of Kirk. Keep actually deciding not to. Or did he just play that? Interesting. Went a little bit too fast for me. I guess he just played that Cobalt of Kirkkeep, and that's why he's not attacking. It's still a summoning sickness. That makes perfect sense. Or, or else I'm sure he would have attacked. Now we see him tapping for two. Well, we see a Sylvan. Oh, we see the Demonic Tutor of Michael. And I think it's a foreign one. Is that a German one or an Italian one? Considering we're in Germany, I'm guessing it's a German one. There we see a Mountain from Alexander, and he's playing a Fireball. Interesting that he's choosing to play a Fireball for one. If it would have waited one turn longer and had another land drop, he could have taken care of the Lunar Elves and the Savannah Lions. So is he kind of showing with this play that he's actually holding, for example, a Wheel of Fortune in hand? And probably an Ancestral Recall now, yeah. So he uses Demonic to look up an Ancestral Recall, drawing three extra now. And he's looking for land, it seems. Very low on land here. Playing a Mishra's Factory into another Lunar Elves. Okay, I guess Lunar Elves is another way to kind of get your mana fix. And he's untapping here another Cobalt of Kirk Keep. I'm actually expecting him to just attack here. Remember, the Mishra's Factory cannot be activated because the Lunar Elves still has Summoning Sickness. 
And of course, the Mishra can activate, can use its own mana to activate itself, but then it cannot block anymore because it's tapped. So I think Michael is just going to take the damage here. Then he's going to drop to 13. And it looks like that's exactly what's going to happen. And we see a pass turn here. So no Wheel of Fortune from Alexander. I kind of thought that maybe he has a wheel because of that Fireball for one. And he's going to take another damage. Tapping four here. Well, we see an Urnum. Exactly. Urnum Jin. Now that the Sidney Nabal is gone, he can play out his Urnums again. There's Soul Ring. Tapping for four. Suchi. What is he going to do? Is he just going to swing in for full? I mean, he is the red aggro player, right? That's what you want to do. I'm curious here, what is he going to do? What decision is he going to make? Looking at his one card, only one card in hand. And I think that's his biggest danger here. He only has one card, Michael has a lot. So he's attacking right now with everything he has. And this is quite interesting. He's using Mace of If aggressively. Usually you would think if you build an aggro style deck, why play with a Mace of If, you know? Why even include it? Well, you can see here why he's attacking. Michael is declaring the block with the uh, Urnum. And in response, before damage is dealt, Alexander is using the mace to take the Taskmaster out of the combat situation. So quite a nice play from Alexander. He's able to deal two more damage to Michael. He's on 10, attacking now with the Urnum. But remember, he's still on 20. He can, he can take the damage. He's going to 16. No problem for Alexander here. Life is a resource. And tapping four here, there's a book, a Jam Day Tome. That could be quite useful for him, trying to fish perhaps for more direct damage to finish off this game. Remember, 10 seems pretty high, but when you're playing against four bolts and some fireballs, I mean, your life total can go down quite quickly. Attacking now with everything. And here we see that sword supplies here. We saw it in game one. We're seeing it in game number two. So he's taking care of the Taskmaster, blocking both Cobbles of Kirkkeep with the Lenore Elves. This is brutal for Alexander here. The only good news for him now is that he's still able to deal four damage. That means Michael's going to drop to five. So that, I mean, also for Michael now, using the City of Brass is less and less tempting. It's his only white source, but he's on five. And if he loses, if he uses his city, he gets damage. He drops to four. That's 20% of his life total that he loses by just tapping his City of Brass. And look at that. He's going to do it. So he's going to go to four here, changing his mind, untapping, probably realizing he's really low on life. Look at that, he's going full pressure. This is quite interesting, attacking here, knowing... This is interesting, right? He probably knows that Alexander is going to untap his Surrendip. I'm a little bit surprised that Alexander does this. Perhaps I would have chosen to untap uh, his Maze of F here. I mean, sorry, his Mishra's Factory. He's attacking now, tapping. There's a Swords, taking the damage. Taking four life, using the four mana for the uh, Jam Day Tome, which is quite nice. Actually finding a new Suchi, putting it on the board. And this is really nice. Jam Day Tome and Suchi, they really go hand in hand because you can use the four mana at any time. Usually the problem is that Suchi dies in combat. Now there is a thing I wonder about now that I'm re-watching this match. I'm thinking, hey, Swords to Plowseers on Suchi, are you actually getting the four mana? Let me know in the comments below because I think you don't because it's removed from the game. It's not going to the graveyard. So I could be wrong here, but let me know in the comments below what's actually happening here. Attacking with the Urnum, attacking with the Lanor Elves as well. Interesting, very aggressive play here. Mace of If on the Urnum, taking two damage, deciding not to block with the Suchi. And there is a Psionic Blast. Wow, so he's actually going to two. This is very risky by Michael, but what else can he do? So going to two, and remember, he's now also giving Alexander a card because he can use that four mana to draw a card with his Yemde Tome. You see him here drawing a card. He's not even tapping the Tome, uh, playing a Kobolds of Kirkkeep, using the Tome again, and there's a Lightning Bolt, and that means it's 1-1. One, one. We see the nice fist bump. Everybody's really friendly here at these old school events. So it is 1-1. One, one. So these players are going to have one final look at their sideboards and then they will battle it out who is going to go to the semi-finals of the Lions no the Urborg Lions Plains Pillage tournament here in Dusseldorf will it be Michael on the right or Alexander on the left game number three who will make it to the semi-finals will it be the Kobolds of Alexander or the white green blue agro control build 
of Michael, who's sitting here on the right, and I believe he's on the play. Starting with the Zavanna and a lot nowhere else. Nice start. He oh, always gets even better. Mox Pearl into Zavanna line. So that's some aggro here on the board. And just a Mishra's factory here from Alexander and a pass turn. So no Kobolds of Kirkkeep. There's a Tropical Island. He's probably going to swing in here for, is it going to be two or three? He's swinging in for two. So I'm expecting to see an Urnum Jin here. Turn number two, Urnum Jin. This is what you want to do when you're Michael. So immediate pressure, there's a Cobalt Taskmaster. At least it's something. It's not going to be enough, but it's something. The question is now, is he going to attack with the Savannah Alliance as well, offering to trade? Looking at his hand, thinking what to do. And is he going to... Oh, tapping four. Is he going to play another... Oh, Ar Armageddon. Okay, <laughs> this is pretty sweet for Michael. This is what he wants to do. This is your classic earn him get move, actually. You're ahead on the board, and then you play your Armageddon to take advantage of your powerful creatures. And also that Black Lotus is pretty sweet for Michael. And there we see another Mishra's factory, and he's just passing turn here. Things are looking really well. He's not even untapping his earn him, just saying, hey, I'm just going to attack again. That means that Alexander is going to drop to 10 here. We do see Alexander finding another mountain, so that's pretty good. He is like rebuilding his lands. And there we see a Bloodlust. So he's trying to kill the Urnum, but look at that. A blue Elemental Blast taking care of that Bloodlust. So that's more bad news for Alexander here. Of course, the blue Elemental Blast coming from the sideboard. There is the Cobalt Lieutenant, I believe. Really cool art on that one. And there's a Savannah attacking here. And is he going to chump block or is he just going to take the damage? He's on 10, pretty low. Deciding to chump here, it seems. So that means he's going to stay on 10. And there's a Demonic Tutor to make matters even worse for Alexander here. What can he do? Tapping 4. There is a Suchi, at least at something. And now it's going to be interesting to see if Alexander is actually going to block the Urnum Jin next turn or not. And I also wonder what Michael's going to look up with his Demonic Tutor. He doesn't have a blue source to play an Ancestral Recall. So I wonder what he's looking for. Let's see what he's going to do. Is he just passing turn? You know, he's attacking, of course. And Alexander taking the damage makes sense. He wants to find something else to be able to double block and kill the Urnum next turn. Tapping for four, another Armageddon. So I guess the Demonic Tutor looked up the other Armageddon, wiping out all the lands again. I mean, it, it's looking very dire here for Alexander. I mean, I, I cannot really see a way out of this for him. He's he's probably got a block here at the Urnum. Or is he just going to take the damage? He's going to drop to two here. He needs to find something. He needs to find another blocker to survive this. If Michael wins here, he's going to go to the semifinals. Are we going to see that happen right now? Attacking with both. And yes, that's exactly what's happening here. We see the fist bump. And this is it. Michael, congratulations. He is going to continue to the semifinals. Now, if you'd like to see the semifinals next week on a Tuesday again, I will post the semis right here on Timmy Talk. So just keep an eye on the channel and you will see that semifinals. Talking about the channel... Thank you for watching another episode. If you want to support us, you can do that by leaving a like, leaving a comment, sharing this on your social socials. All that really helps to show YouTube how much you appreciate the content that we're making here at Timmy Talks. And you can also subscribe. So if you're not a sub yet, please consider subscribing. It really, really helps. Another thing that you can do is support the channel financially by becoming a patron on Patreon. There's probably a card popping up right now. Click on the link and have a look and see what you can do um, if you want to support Timmy Talks financially as well. So if you want to become a sponsor. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?